Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Friday. Everybody. How is everybody? Oh, can't believe Buckinghamshire, of all places, has gone into tier three. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm we're, sorry. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And, and apparently we're not going to be out of it till the end of January. Yeah. The end of Jan now. Yeah. It's I know. so depressing and... and you know, the mental health of people, I just don't, I really don't know what will happen. It's just absolutely destroying people, yeah. destroying their businesses, everything. We're here for each other, thank goodness. And it's the sense yeah. of powerlessness, which is so crushing. Yeah. But at least we can keep going, thanks to all of us being here for each other and for everyone else. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, the thing is that we are here for you guys as well. So, yeah. you know, we yeah. feel miserable or depressed just watch this show that'll make you <laughs> think about it. it'll either make you feel worse or better yeah, absolutely. yeah. yeah. yeah but, but we're here and we've got lots of things coming up in the next sort of week or so we've got a lovely panto which is so exciting and we've got christmas with bob barrett actually we've got we've got loads and loads of things coming up all yeah, of our best bits so we we've, we're with you for the christmas but we'll be with we you are. for the we're, we really will be so please yeah. keep your spirits up and we're here next year and we're, we're not going anywhere yeah yes, you can try but well said. you can try and get rid of us but it's not happening darlings we're going to be here oh, no. so brace yep. brace brace for 2021 brace, Absolutely. Brace, brace. Absolutely. now we've got a fantastic guest actually coming in who is a very very old friend of mine but i was thinking how long i've known sherry and how long i've known Dee and how long i've known harriet and actually the weirdest thing is that I haven't known Tony as long as I've known you guys. But oh. I've, kind of, I've kind of had more adventures with him and oh. his wife, Jan. Yes. He's a writer. He was one of the lead writers in EastEnders at the very, very beginning. He created Holby City. He's one of the most talented people in our industry. And I'm proud to say he's my friend, Tony McHale. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Sherry. Wow. Hiya. <laughs> Whole glamour. <laughs> it must we be try, a, a collective noun. Is there a collective noun for glamour? The Wonderbirds. The Wonderbirds. Yes, the Wonderbirds. Oh, That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good, Tony. That's very we'll, we'll keep that one. So, Tony, we have been friends for hundreds of years, but actually, I was saying to the girls, I've actually known them probably because we we probably met in the in the late eighties, but but since then we have been on a lot of adventures together. Lots of adventures. <laughs> Can we discuss any of them or are they? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think some of them are probably not, you know, for the Discussable. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, That's what not I thought. Even for Wonder Birds. <laughs> no, <laughs> privately, <laughs> Dee, privately. <laughs> but, but Tony, I mean, he has, in fact, Bob Barrett, as you know, Tony, is one of, he comes on here doing a cooking program. Can you believe no. that? Yes, Bob yes. Barrett from a whole <laughs> Vegan as well. That, that's a bit like, um, uh, I, does he know anything about cooking, Bob? Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <Are you, laughs> it seems to. Are you, I used to do a spot on Sky. When Sky first opened, it was a show called Sky by Day, which was hosted by Jenny Hanley and Tony Blackburn. Oh, wow. And I, wow. And I, used to, I used to do a weekly spot as a DIY expert. And... I know nothing about DIY. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, this is the truth. If I pick up a hammer, my kids ring the ambulance or they <laughs> know it's going to be a disaster. But that's, I, so brilliant. that's why I asked whether he knew anything about it, because I didn't know anything about DIY. <laughs> oh, so my what, the hell did, what did you talk about? What did yeah. you talk about if you couldn't do it? Oh, well, we used to get questions in from the viewers, right? Yeah. And, the, yeah. and the producer would give me the answers. So I just learned <laughs> them. And, and then, I, then, but then I got into this idea about that my mother-in-law would be doing. And my mother-in-law, who is genuinely what's called Doris, I would say, so I'd be holding oh. a ladder for Doris while she climbed up on the roof <laughs> to fix the bottling or whatever. So it got, she became a sort of off-screen character. In my mother in law. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> That's amazing. Tony. Tony, you did loads, loads, and loads, and loads of commercials, didn't you, at one point? Literally. Loads of Thousands. Ones. Yeah. Yeah, loads. I did uh, so many, so I just can't remember them all. They see, they come back to me and go, oh, I did a commercial there, or I did a <laughs> commercial for that company, or whatever. Yeah, I did loads. Yeah. You know, and funny enough, I've been doing it during this whole lockdown thing. 
I've been um, doing at my office, you know, and I, I'm terrible about keeping scripts. I keep everything script wise. I don't know why I'm hooked onto scripts. And, uh, and I've found all these commercial scripts that I'd done, you know, not all of them by any stretch of imagination, but a lot of them. And, uh, and the ones I don't even remember doing. <laughs> the commercials I don't even, you know, I, I've got a whole series of Fred Bentos commercials. Which no. I, I don't remember doing at all. No. I thought I was drunk or something. Because <laughs> like Tony, That's you're funny. also, as well as an amazing writer, you're also an incredible actor, aren't you? I, I think that's rather disputable. The world, <laughs> yes, I was an actor, but incredible is probably not the correct word. But you were in Coronation Street. So yes, he's wonderful. very notorious for Coronation Street, aren't you, Tony? Yes, tell us yeah. about that, Tony. Well, Coronation Street, I did Coronation Street twice, actually. In fact, Coronation Street was my first little sortie onto TV, but it was a real, really small part uh, must have been uh, 1973 or 74 or something like that. And I went in and I was a bad guy because I burnt a hole in Deirdre's coffee table. <laughs> oh, no. no! Very bad. I, I, Outrageous. For one, episode, for one episode, I was Helen Worth's boyfriend, you know, and we went to a party at Deirdre's and I got booted out, you know. So that was my <laughs> first sorte. And then by a bizarre coincidence world, yeah, um, Annie Kirkbride, who uh, played Deirdre, of course, um, was actually then ended up marrying the guy who was the best man at my wedding. Yeah. Uh, so it's a real small world when you think about yeah. it, Dave Beckett, yeah. And, uh, th and in fact, they got together because I was working in Manchester at the time, uh, doing something else totally different. And um, Dave said, oh, let's get together. Cause, and he said, I really want to get Annie out and chat her up. So I said, okay, we'll arrange to meet me. And that's <laughs> what happened. So I feel very responsible for that relationship. So, sorry, I digress. The uh, <laughs> second time we've gone, uh, my agent, it was just before Christmas, I remember, and my agent rang me up and actually said, uh, uh, do you want to do, do uh, uh, Coronation Street again? And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I'd go, yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. of course. Anything, anything. Of course. great. And I said, and then I get to the script, and I'm, part of this killing of Ernie Bishop. And I'm, I and I'm know. Thinking, fantastic. I've never, I always used to play the good guy. Like you say, the commercials, dad next door, you know, boyfriend <laughs> next door, whatever. So I never played killers. You know, it was a real breakthrough. I felt Dirty Harry, you know, it was really right. amazing. It was terrifying. But it was terrifying. But it was it was terrifying. terrifying. How good is that? I, Tony, I watched it again the other night. I watched yeah. it again. Oh, really? And, yeah, and, and um, when Mike Baldwin bangs the door open, don't you remember? And that's when the gun goes yeah. off. Yeah. The sure enough, uh, shotgun. That's when it yeah. goes off and he kills yeah. poor Ernie. It was poor terrifying Ernie. at the time. Oh, it was huge at the time. We hit every huge. National, national newspaper, you know. It was no! And the biggest difference, Sherry, about it in those days, it actually <laughs> killed my career. Nobody wanted to touch me. Killed my career. Where nowadays, you'd be a star, wouldn't you? you yes. Know? Yeah. Then, but no, you know, yes. it, was so, it was so badly received by people. In fact, well, the next gig I did on TV after that was we did a documentary called Death on the Street. And, oh, no! Uh, yeah, that was, that was about nine months later. And um, I've always got to remember this fantastically funny bit that happened. They got these women who'd brought uh, this petition which said, bring back Ernie. And I thought, oh. well, how are we going to bring him back? He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> how are you going to bring him Listen, back? Listen, darling, I have to say something. <laughs> That phone call possibly could have been your agent because I think now Corey wants you back. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to get that. I sh you should have answered that phone because clearly it's your agent. They want you back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or he could come back in a dream like Dallas. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but, but Tony, Tony tell, tell everybody there's a, there's a very strange synergy about what happened with Ernie Bishop and his brother in EastEnders. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah, that was another weird one because it was uh, Stephen Hancock that yeah. played Ernie Bishop. Uh, and uh, I, got, I got attacked in the streets and various things. After. It was <laughs> really God. weird. 
Anyway, then, you know, some time later, was writing on EastEnders. And uh, I was responsible uh, for killing off uh, Charlie Cotton, who was Doc Cotton's old man at the time. Wow! And, uh, and uh, he was Stephen Hancock's brother. He was, that's right! <laughs> And so that is terrible. I think the, the Sun ran this article about then brought in the henchman or something to kill <laughs> off the next cotton. You know what I mean? It was uh, just really bizarre. But oh, they, I do think oh they, how they weird! Hadn't out, they hadn't figured out I was an actor on one of them and a writer on the other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just thought it was this guy that went around killing people in soaps. You know. Well, thank oh, God it stopped. <laughs> so. I just uh, ask you about Holby now, right. because I understand you were the first writer-led person to take on Holby. Is that right? I mean, what happened was, funny enough, when we started EastEnders, uh, that was run by a guy called Tony Holland, who was the script yeah. editor then. But roles were slightly different then. Uh, but that was really, to begin with, for the first year, maybe two years, a very much writer-led show because Tony was a writer. Right. So we were very much part of the creation of that show and everything about it. But then that sort of dwindled away because people don't like giving writers too much power. No, but that's many, true. Many years later, I was uh, asked to create a spin-off for um, Casualty. Uh, and I, to begin with, said, no, nah, I can't be bothered, no thank you. So it said, okay, you know, eventually I said, okay, I will do it. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, I ended up deciding it was going to feature around a, a cardiac ward. Very simply, you know, the heart being the center of the, the body yeah. and the heart being the center of life's emotions. So it seemed like a perfect match. But the idea was to do, a, you know, a series about what happened to patients when they left A&E. So that's, that's what it was about. Um, so I developed that series. I wrote, um, I, we only did nine in the first series. I think I wrote four oh. or five of those. Uh, and then it went to 16 and I wrote a few more. Then I left the show. And I left the show because I didn't think it was going in the direction I wanted it to go in. And because I'd sort of created it, I, you, you get sort of more personal about it. Of course. It's easier to go into a show and say that you haven't created and go, I'll just do that. Yeah, because yeah. I'm a gun for hire. Let's go and do it. Yeah. But when you've created something, you 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 get very emotionally attached to it. So yeah. and I thought we'd done something quite special as well to begin with Holby because launching a long running series, as you know, as we all know, isn't easy. You know, no. we, we got some really good reviews, but that's another story entirely. But uh, <laughs> some, some years later, then I was asked if I could go back and consult on it because it was starting to wax and wane. And it was quite interesting because I went back almost on my own terms. Uh, I said, I will do, but I've got this, that and the other. And after a little while of consulting, I was asked if I'd take over as executive producer lead writer and story consultant. So that's like a showrunner. So yeah. I had every aspect of the show. And uh, it was the first time on a long running show that had actually happened. happened but yeah. it was terrific for me. I was going to do a year there and I ended up doing four. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, but, but it's absolutely exhausting if you do the job right. You yeah. know, I'd be editing stuff at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, because I was responsible for not only the scripts, but also the picture edit, uh, the stories, long running stories, everything. So it was a really full on time job, but I loved it. I've got to be honest, uh, but you do need after a little while, a little break from it. because a stop, To stop, oh, yes. To recharge. Yeah. You know, because otherwise it just eats you up. Um, when we heard you were coming on, Debbie did inform us that it was in fact an audition. So I want to know, do you want my my modern speech or my Shakespeare? <laughs> which I'll do in a minute, first of all. And also- or self tapes. Um, yeah, so, no, I don't do self tapes. So not when we have this, yeah. not when we have the wonder of Zoom. <laughs> um, but what are you doing next, darling? What's happening next? Uh, what I'm doing now, funnily enough, is 
pleasing myself, <laughs> which is great, I've got to be honest. I, about four or five years ago, I woke up one morning and I thought, I cannot write another long running series. I cannot, I've given up with it. I, you know, what was happening, I was waking up in the morning and starting to, to work thinking, I don't like this job anymore. And probably like all of us here, that isn't why we joined. We joined because we love it. Yeah. Because I yeah. get a buzz out of it, I get a thrill out of it. And that's what I didn't want to lose. And so I thought I'm luckily enough in a position that I could just say, oh, okay, I won't do any more of those. I'll just do what I want to do. So I managed to, um, I've written a couple of books. Uh, I'm writing a little, a bird, sorry? A little birdie told me you've written a musical. I wrote a music, that was what we did in Edinburgh, which is great, which was a spin-off from a TV show we did. We did a show called Headless for Channel 5, a 10-part horror thriller it story. It was hilarious, <laughs> which of course I was, I was in, and uh, the, the funniest thing about it was you had my ex-husband covered in rats, didn't you? I had him covered in rats. <laughs> How in much did you have to pay, Debbie? How much did you have to pay? Because we'd like, to with you. I think we'd all like to have that uh, facility, if that's okay. <laughs> that hour. <laughs> but it, 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 in fact, Debbie's responsible, partly responsible for the musical because after we, what what was in in the TV show was a a story strand of a a, a, a young girl who was a protege when she was a kid who was play, actually Debbie's daughter, played by Francis <laughs> Francis Raphael, who was actually about the same age as Debbie. <laughs> that, that was another story as well. But the idea was to relaunch her daughter's career. Uh, and I was wanting to do Psycho the musical because I thought it fit with Ooh, horror theme. Yeah, and, yeah. But I Sounds couldn't good. get the rights. I just couldn't get the rights and time was coming on. So I thought, oh, sorry, I'll write my own. So I wrote yeah. a thing called Bloodbath the musical. <laughs> yes. Uh, which, when we did Very it similar. The, <laughs> <laughs> when, when we did it in the TV, well, actually, part of the reason is that the character in it, um, Actually, one of the reasons he behaves in the way he does is because he watched Psycho when he was a kid. Of when he course. was there's a song about him watching the lyric about <laughs> uh, uh, it was it was Psycho that did it to me. <laughs> I was seen. I was only three. <laughs> Woman in the shower couldn't quite see the normal bits of Janet Lee. So <laughs> we need to see this. We need to see this as soon as possible. Yeah, you, we you, do. Oh, are we all in it? And, and after that, after the TV show, Debbie and you others said, you've got to write that as a fully blown musical. Hence we did. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's how it came about. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love it. So what love are you that. actually doing right now? What's your next thing? Move? Um, actually, just in touch with some people in the state. Well, I, I had a couple of big jobs cancelled this summer. Oh. What was... Uh, a thing for Fox Disney in South Africa, uh, which was great, called The Unit. I'd already written the pilot episode, but when all this thing kicked off, they not only jumped the uh, series, they jumped their whole South African department. Oh. And then there was another one for Sweden that was going to do, which was a 10-part uh, thriller, which is was great. I was really excited about <laughs> that. And then that got cancelled because of oh. that thing. So... Uh, but I've just teamed up with somebody else in the States, somebody new in the States, and I'm, um, they're interested in doing doing the book. Wow. Fabulous. What's it called? Beckley Street. Beckley Street. So the book is out now? The book is out now. It's on Amazon, yeah. Then I'm doing a couple of other TV things for them as well, developing a couple of other TV things. Which, Fabulous. Uh, and and that's, the, that's what we're all in. Is that right, darling? <laughs> Yeah, of course, Harriet. Of course. Thank you. Know, you. I'm just, I'm just you know, Harriet, <laughs> you don't have to do an audition tape for me. I'm more than aware of your gift. <laughs> but knowing you, but knowing you, Tony, it'll be murder and and killing and death on the Orient Express or something. Ooh, <laughs> of course. I fancy that. Actually, <laughs> Tony, I, I'm going to ask this in front of all of us. Perhaps you should write us a little tiny drama that we can zoom. Oh yes. Yes. But yes. we'll die. die. <laughs> Hashtag no pressure, darling, at all. One. But this is live and you have said yes, so it's there. There you go, murder mystery. Yes. Thank you so much for visiting, <laughs> darling. It's too late. Hashtag too late, darling. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, it's darling. It's been lovely. Lovely. I love you. Uh, uh, uh.
Have a great Christmas. Have a great Thank Christmas. Thank you. Love, Love you, Jan. Oh, oh wonderful. So we've got another I'm... job. Thank you, Debbie. Oh, uh, I'll tell you what, I love, I love him and Jan, his wife. I think they're the most incredible yes. couple. They're, aren't they gorgeous? Oh, Lovely we people. Talk, we talk for hours and the fact that you were at Harrogate Rep, because that's where I think Tony first started as well, Sherry. So, you know. It, yes, it's I know. I realised when, he, when yeah. he said it. That's right, yeah. And when he said Jenny Hanley, I did my first rep with her in Nottingham Playhouse with Richard Eyre. And I, I did. Yeah. I worked with Richard Eyre too as, as a kid, as a young, as a mature yeah. person in twenties. Darling, <laughs> listen, I can't. I'd love to go on talking, but we have to bring in somebody very special. And I've yeah. taken over the role today because I don't know if our viewers know, but we interchange our children when we need to. <laughs> yes. And um, I'm what now going to be the Wonderbird mother today of the brilliant Talia Jansen, and she's here to tell us all about her amazing charity, which, which she, well, we'll get her in. Talia, darling, are you flying in? Hi. Yes, yes. Hello. Hi. Talia, Christmas. Yes. Darling, Merry welcome. Christmas. <laughs> now, you know, I'm your mother just for the show. So oh. I want you to tell us as much as possible, because you are a singer, you are a voiceover star. There's nothing you don't do. And now you have just done Buses for the Homeless, which I believe you are now a patron of. I am. It's probably one of my greatest achievements. I'm very, very pleased about it. Um, so yeah, I kind of am, um, like most people in this industry, just have fingers in many pies. Um, <laughs> oh <many> God! <laughs> Please tell us, how did this come about and tell us exactly what you did? Because it's so, um, To London With Love 2020. Yes, To London With Love 2020. Um, and it's sort of in the name. It was all about spreading love. And it came about uh, a couple of years ago, actually. And um, I was feeling very unwell one Christmas and feeling a bit sorry for myself and had this moment of reflection where I thought, God, I'm feeling this horrendous in a in a nice warm bed, in a nice house with my mum looking after me. Thank you, Debbie. Um, <laughs> I, I take that, credit for that because I'm your mother today. Sorry. Yes, you are my, you're my temporary mother. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah. Um, okay, I just, I just had this moment of feeling very lucky and wanting to give back. Um, so I set myself a, a mammoth task of going out into London streets and delivering a hundred Christmas sacks filled with all sorts of goodies to those who live up on the streets. Um, and I put it up on social media as everyone does these days and just got a huge overwhelming response. Um, and it kind of snowballed and picked up loads of momentum. And it was hugely successful back in 2018. And given the year that everyone's had this year, I thought, what better time to do it all over again? So that's exactly oh. what I did. Um, and yeah, we managed to raise um, 4,000, well, over 4,500 pounds for this amazing charity called Buses for Homeless. Um, and, and we went out and we delivered once again. Actually, this time we managed to do 130 uh, Christmas sacks and deliver them wow. all to the homeless in a big red bus. Wow. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. It, um, Has it been more yeah. difficult being in the COVID situation, Talia? Yes. Yeah, so this year, it's actually been, it was more difficult for an amazing reason. So this year, a lot of the homeless have been put into hostels yes. and they've been put into unused hotels. So when we actually first got to London to go out and deliver the sacks, there weren't actually that many people around. And we had this moment of thinking, oh, we're not going to get rid of all the sacks, which is a good thing, but also what's the bad because we had all these things to give, um, all the money that was raised, all the donations that we had sent in. And um, we did think, are, are we going to get rid of them all? But to be honest with you, as soon as it got to four o'clock, there was a soup <laughs> kitchen in Victoria and the right. amount of people that were there, they went in 10 minutes, which just goes to show wow. that wow. people to housing, essentially, they still have, you know, they don't have any money. They don't have any money for food. They don't have any sources. Yeah. So I they know. went. And it's 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 mm -hmm. a it's a crazy situation to think that how far the world has come in 2020 and how everyone's been so resourceful, especially this year. And yeah. yet there are some people out there who have to rely on public services. And that's what's so yeah. sad, isn't it? We haven't come very far then, have we? No. To be honest. It's just a whole a whole new world. There's a lot of people living in this world now and mm. it, it, it has to get a job. Everyone wants to be working, which is amazing. Yeah. But you know, Talia, you worked so hard, but you know, actually putting all the, the the sacks together. I mean, you were exhausted. You must have been exhausted. But I'm so glad that ITV took it up on on the news for you. Yeah, you've got great coverage. Well it done on that. 
we yeah we spent eight hours it took uh for four of us to pack the sacks um and it was like i'd been to the gym for a week the next day it was absolutely <laughs> um but yeah we managed to get the itv news to come down um and they put us on the on the clock slot and um just it's just amazing to be able to raise, raise awareness for these kind of charities exactly. because Buffers the homeless are fantastic are incredible charity and um, i'm honored to be asked to be a patron of their charity it made me extremely happy so, very well, deserved so you should so you should <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I mean, Dan, um, if you explain to everybody, I know we've, we've got some footage of you uh, packing and all of the stuff that you did, and it was brilliant. But can you explain to the girls what actually Buses for Homeless do? Because it's an incredible charity. Yes, I can. So Buses for Homeless are, the, the, the queue is in the name, but it's, <laughs> what they do is they take, they take unused double-decker buses. I like to think of it that the buses that are retired from working, that's how I like to think of it. Um, they take double-decker buses and they turn them into sleeper pods for the homeless. So, ah. so, yeah, and they take, so they have, at the moment, they have a base in London where they have four buses and they're all stationed in a little square. And in this square, one of the buses at the moment is sleeper pods. The other bus is where they have some food. Another bus is where they do rehabilitation. So they give them access to a laptop so they can set up an email address. Oh, so Wow. Yeah, and then in, and then the Fabulous. other one is where they keep all their storage. Really? Um, and these, these buses are incredible, and what they do is amazing because it's not just giving someone a place to sleep at night; it's the whole process of getting them back into society and being able to being able to work and being able to provide for themselves. Yeah, and giving them some hope in life as well. Exactly. Mm, you know, a lot of people rely on having a purpose most of the time, and if if you're given that opportunity to have a purpose again. That whole mental state can change your whole life. Um, so they have, they have these buses and they also have community buses which go out into local communities, that go to soup kitchens, that provide clothes, they provide sort of a health packs and things for them and try and spread the word about what they do. And with the leftover money that we had from the donations, because we had so, so much of it, we've actually given to the charity so they can run their buses for the next couple of months with the donations, which is amazing for them. I'm really happy that we're so you'll be doing it next year talia won't you i hope so i think the aim now is to do it every year we've done it twice and i think yeah. now that we need to carry on yes you have to can oh, i well ask you something done. darling can i ask you something because not only have you done this beautiful and moving thing which is now going to hopefully as you said be yearly you also are a singer and i've had the privilege of working with you a bit and also watching you perform what have you felt this year with singing? Because a lot of places are closed where I've seen you work and things. They're not there. How has it been for you as a singer? Yes, I mean, as, as I think everybody is feeling, this year has been very strange and it's kind of realigned people's priorities. And I think being a singer and being self-employed and all that kind of thing, you kind of take for granted how lucky you are to be able to go and get to do those things. Um, and as a performer, it's it's something which keeps you going. It's your spark, you know? So to not have that for the past, well, for the past year, yeah. Really, yeah. It's, been, it's been really, really difficult. Um, it just means that my boyfriend has had to hear me singing a lot more inside. <laughs> <laughs> Ever had to before. Oh, um, darling, he's him. still there. He's still there, darling. That's impressive. You can't really leave, to be honest. Um, <laughs> no, nowhere to go. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been will you and Debbie will you and Debbie tell us that wonderful story about because you do voiceovers and it was both your daughters wasn't it Debbie and you all did a particular line of a product oh yes we are we are the Kardashians please uh, um because Talia is what are you the voice of um <laughs> so well but just for a tiny bit of context all of us do we're very lucky that all of us do voiceovers in my family my my dad my mum my sister and myself all do them and uh, we obviously all sound different but mm. we obviously have a theme going through the through the family excluding my dad because it'd be very strange if he did this but there was a point in time where I was lucky enough to be the voice of body form the sanitary towels uh, my sister was also on air she was the voice of always sanitary products and my mother was the voice of tenor <laughs> but, of course. <laughs> but I want to give your father a little hope because there are now tenor for men so it could all come together yes there you go there tenor you go, go. We can 2021 <laughs> 2021 tenor world that's all I'm saying tenor world exactly we're all, oh, we're thank all there. you so much darling <laughs> you're amazing. amazing thank oh, you so much darling. darling have a great Christmas Talia See you soon, darling. See you soon. Bye. Congratulations again. Bye, Bye darling. Bye.
Oh, you must be so proud, darling. She's amazing. Oh, yes, she sir. really is. And we are going to say that we were we were the Kardashians of pads, weren't we? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Can't ask exactly more. Right. <laughs> it was. It was just when the agent when our agent rang up and said, you know, obviously, and he just was laughing. He just said, "They want you to tell her." Obviously, I, I just thought. How cruel, oh, how cruel. That is hilarious. Yes, and now <laughs> David so, can join in. <laughs> exactly, the world is now opening. Yes, what next? I'm so anxious to hear that story because I love it so much. But tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow we get wine glasses at the ready because yeah. we have been sent some fabulous wines by Wines With Stories. So we're going yeah. to have our Christmas party with Richard Arnold. So yes, yes. yay. Yeah. 10 a.m. tomorrow. Bye, 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 bye. Bye. Hey, Wonderbirds, it's me, Beverly Knight, wishing you a very Merry Christmas and a happy and healthy New Year. 2021 cannot come quick enough. Bring it on, let's go, and I'll see you in the New Year. Wonderful Wonderbirds, it's the Speakmans and we're here to wish you a very happy Christmas. Yeah, we hope that your festive season is filled with fun and laughter and of course gin and mulled wine. Have a great time. Happy, happy Christmas. Christmas! Hello Wonderbirds, happy Christmas and a very good new year to you. Lots of love, I love being on the show and I'll see you next year I hope. All the best. Mwah.